Well, I feel like I haven't been here in like forever to Mill Creek. It's great to be here. It's a little hectic going back and forth, but I really look forward to being here on this campus today. And by the way, we do have um, lots of our Chapel Street kids here in the service today because of the month of August. And hopefully all of you, if you're younger, picked up one of these Chapel Street kids worship notes pages. Did you get one of these? Because these are really awesome. I was looking at this. Um, Becky Chenault made these for all of you, and it gives you a great way to follow along with the sermon, and you can even get a prize, I think, at the end. And so if you're a parent and you did not pick up one of these for yourself, think about it next time, because it might help you pay attention. These are really nice. No prizes for you, but you can use it to follow along. Well, a number of years ago, I was on my way to church, I think, during the middle of the week sometime, and I had to run a couple of errands. Um, I needed to go deposit a check at the bank. Way before the days you could do it electronically, uh, I needed to run an errand to pick up lawn bags or something. So um, I drove to the ATM at my bank, and when I went through, I, I punched in um, $10. Now, I need to say something here. I, I don't like to carry a lot of cash in my pocket. My brother makes fun of me all the time. I just don't. I don't know why. I just don't. That explains why I asked it for $10. In fact, it shows you how long ago it was because there's not even that option anymore. You have to get at least 20 now. But I asked for $10. And when the money came out and the receipt came out, I just grabbed them because I was in a hurry, put it in my pocket, and drove to the hardware store, got the lawn bags. And as I walked up to pay at the register, I took the money out of my pocket. And what I took out, I was confused because I took out a 20, not a 10 that I'd asked for. And I knew it was the only money I had because I didn't have any other cash. So I put it back in my, I got the receipt out there and looked at it. And sure enough, I, it said $10. But I had a 20 in my pocket. So I put it all back and used my, my debit card to pay, and then got in my car and checked again. Looked at it again, 20, 10. So then, just to be sure, I drove back to my bank. Went to the same ATM machine, tapped, typed in $10 again, and $20 came out. My first thought was, God is so good to me all the time. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, I had a decision to make. Because what I found myself thinking, I'm sitting in the car holding my second 20 in my hand, thinking of all those times, you know, my bank charged me 20 bucks for something a little small with uh, overdraft, or, or the $2 it charged me every time I went to another ATM. It wasn't my fault that it was being extra generous, was it? Well, then I had this little voice in my head that said, maybe you should go back inside the bank and tell them their machine has a problem. Oh, by the way, and take those two 20s with you which is what I ended up doing. Now, we all deal with money every day. We know that. We all need money to live. Uh, we all deal with it every day. We know that wealth plays a huge role in our culture, in our lives, uh, uh, day to day. But we also know that money or wealth has a certain power to it. I call it a gravitational attraction. It, it pulls things out of shape. It pulls things toward it. Our hearts, our minds, the way we think, even $20 is enough to pull out of shape. And that's what James wants to talk to us about a bit today. We're in a summer-long series from the book of James called Street Level Faith. And through the first four chapters, James has been addressing a whole series of issues with these um, early Jewish background Christians who were struggling to put their faith into practice. Now as we begin chapter 5, we're going to see James using the strongest, most blunt language yet, and it's actually a little disturbing. So let's open up James chapter 5. We'll put the words on the screen, and you can follow along. James 5, he writes, Come now, you rich, weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. I'm going to pause there just for a second and ask the question, who is he talking to here? Up to this point, he's been writing clearly to this community of dispersed Jewish background Christians who were being persecuted and who were struggling to live out their faith in real life. But most scholars believe that right here, James shifts, that he shifts and he's talking about those outside the faith, possibly to those who are doing the persecuting, and he's doing it kind of in the mold of an Old Testament prophet. Often in the Old Testament, we read the prophets are speaking to the people of Israel. Then all of a sudden, they issue a judgment that's for one of the surrounding pagan nations, but it's issued so that the people of God hear it and are encouraged by it. A lot of scholars think that's what's happening here. In fact, the, the phrase weep and wail uh, comes right out of the prophet Isaiah who writes in chapter 13, wail for the day of the Lord is near, meaning judgment is coming. So even though James may have in mind the surrounding community of non-believers, there are things that we as followers of Christ can hear 
and can understand and can learn from. Verse two, your riches have rotted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver have corroded and their corrosion will be evidence against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have laid up treasure in the last days. Behold, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, are crying out against you. And the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. You have lived on the earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the righteous person. He does not resist you. I'm going to stop there. That's pretty tough stuff. So what can we learn? James begins... Uh, chapter 5, with warnings about wealth. First thing I want to talk about, warnings about wealth. A whole bunch of years ago, my brother Joe, who's a pastor in Ohio, uh, called me. He was all excited about an investment opportunity. Now, it's kind of funny because neither one of us know anything, knew anything about money then. I hardly know anything now. But we were young pastors, fathers of young kids, and we had, didn't even have retirement accounts or college funds, nothing, so we had no money laying around to invest. But he's all excited about this investment because a friend of his was doing it. It was investing in a series of Christian music concerts with the promise of a really high rate of return. Here's how it worked. You would send in an investment to this investment company, this promotions company, say $100. And you were promised a return of 20 40 even 50% and, and within 30 days after the concert was over. That sounded pretty good. So we scraped together a little bit of money, not much, made that first investment. Sure enough, within 30 days, we got a return of 40% on that initial investment. So we did it again. Rolled in that money, found some other money, maybe even borrowed some money, and we happened again. 30 days, 40%. We did this, to make a very long story short, over a period of like two years. And then the last investment we made was in a chunk of concerts, like five of them. And we put, we went all in, everything we had, or everything we had in, because we're, this, it's incredible. And four of those came back. The last one, 30 days go by, 60 days go by, 90 days go by, nothing came back. And then my brother called me again. He had gotten a call from the FBI that said the concert promoter that we were giving our money to had stolen $15 million of everyone's investments all over the country and had left the country and was uh, a fugitive of justice. So we never got that money back. Fortunately, we had kind of broken even over the two years, but we learned a very valuable lesson. And that is when it comes to money, if it seems too good to be true, it probably is. James says, come now, you rich. Weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches have rotted. Your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver have corroded. These are actually four warnings tucked away in three verses here. First, he warns, wealth provides false security. It's a warning. Wealth provides false security. Historians tell us that the culture and time in which James is writing uh, had three main indicators of wealth. They're kind of different than ours. The three indicators of wealth in that culture were food, that if you owned a, a, a field, a farm, or vineyard, and had grain, you were rich because there was no refrigeration, no way to really store everything. So if you owned grain, so yeah, Chris, you'd be a rich man back in the, back in the day. <laughs> so food, grain. Second was clothing. It was a sign of great wealth to have more than one change of clothing. Most poor people had just the clothes on their backs. So clothing. And thirdly was gold and silver, obviously what we would call money. Notice James says, your riches have rotted. What rots? Excess food. Food laying around. It rots. Then he says, your garments are moth-eaten. Even your fine clothing is going to disintegrate before you. Your gold and silver have corroded. What he's saying is everything that you've based your security on, all of your wealth is going to come to nothing. It's going to fail you. Did you see the story about Facebook and Mark Zuckerberg, CEO, this past week? Okay, leave the image on the screen just for a couple minutes. After reporting less than expected earnings and a loss of confidence over security issues, Facebook stock dropped 19% in one day. It was the singest, single largest loss of stock value in American history. At least that's what I read. And Zuckerberg's personal fortune lost $15 billion in one day. Thus the sad face. That's why I wanted it to be up there. Disappeared, gone. That's what James is talking about. Wealth offers false security. Now, I'll take a little detour here. It's important to say the Bible does not teach that money is evil. It doesn't. It teaches that the love of money is the root of all evil, all kinds of evil. The Bible does not teach that possession of great wealth is sinful. Not at all. 
There are plenty of very, very wealthy people, enormously wealthy people in the Bible who are very godly and who honor God with their wealth. Some of the most generous people in the world today are people of unimaginable wealth. For example, did you see the story about basketball star LeBron James this week? It's easy for most of us to look at a guy like LeBron James and think, you know, wealthy, spoiled, entitled, athlete, all that. Many people think that way. But last week, LeBron James launched a new school in Akron, Ohio through his family foundation called the I Promise School. Its purpose is to give at-risk kids in Akron, Ohio, like he was as a child, a chance not just as an, as an education, but at a, as a fu- at a future. The school is free, provides meals every day, job counseling for parents, has a food pantry, every stu- student gets a bicycle. And on top of all that, every single student who graduates from high school, from that school with a 3.0 average, is guaranteed a full-ride college education to the University of Akron. There are 1,200 students eligible. If they all graduate, LeBron James is on the hook for $40 million to pay their education. See, it's not money that's the problem. It's not wealth that's the issue. It's what wealth does to us and what we do with the wealth. One of the things it does to us, James says, is offers false security. Secondly, he warns that wealth is seductive. Seductive. Over the past couple of weeks, I happened to notice something. I stopped by uh, a couple of uh, handy mark gas stations. Get a little gas while it's filling up, go inside, buy something. I really started to like these chocolate cake Twinkies. Have you seen those? Uh, anyway. But as I'm, as I'm buying something, I noticed every single time I went in, there was somebody standing in front of the line of me, sometimes two, buying lottery tickets every time. So I did a little research. I did not know that 44 out of the 50 states in America offer uh, legal lotteries, official lotteries. The largest single ticket lottery winner in history was last year, 2017, a 53-year-old woman won $758 million in a Powerball. The odds of winning that lottery are, do you know what they are? One in 292 million. It means you are 400 times more likely to be struck by lightning than to win a lottery. And yet, last year, Americans spent $70 billion on lottery tickets. That's more than $300 per adult in all 44 states where they're legal in America. In fact, Americans spent more money on lottery tickets last year than they did on sporting events, movie tickets, books, video games, and recorded music combined. In addition, a recent study showed that among those who live below the poverty line in our country, they spend twice as much money every year on lottery tickets than those living above the poverty line, up to 10% of their income. So you have to ask, why? Why do so many people buy tickets? Why do people who can't afford to buy tickets? Because wealth is seductive. It's seductive. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said it this way, Matthew chapter 6, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and God. Money. He's saying that money or wealth actually is a rival to God himself for the devotion and worship of our hearts. Wealth is seductive. Thirdly, he warns that wealth promises what it can't deliver. Promises what it can't deliver. Some of you may recognize this popular country song. The singer is a guy named Chris Jansen. I wish I could sing it for you, but I can't. I ain't rich, but I sure want to be. Working like a dog all day ain't working for me. I wish I had a rich uncle that'd kick the bucket and that I was sitting on a pile like Warren Buffett. Doesn't exactly rhyme, but we'll deal with it. I know everybody says the money can't buy happiness, but it could buy me a boat. <laughs> we all know, know money can't buy happiness, right? We all know money can't buy happiness, but I think deep down, we all think a little more money might buy us a little more happiness. More recent research suggests that income is related to overall life satisfaction up to a point. And then once you reach a certain point of income, the arrow turns in the other direction. Money cannot cannot deliver what it promises. And finally, a fourth warning, that wealth can be destructive to our souls. James says, your gold and silver have corroded, and their corrosion will be evidence against you and will eat your flesh like fire. Yikes. That's referring to the final coming judgment of God on all sin and evil. The end result of worshiping, loving, and serving wealth will be condemnation, it says. 
The Apostle Paul says it this way in 1 Timothy chapter 6, those who want to get rich fall into a temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. And that leads us to the second thing we can look at in James' letter, chapter 5, and that is he points us to the dangers of wealth. The danger. How many of you remember deposed Filipino leader, leader Ferdinand Marcos? Remember Marcos? Somebody? Historians, if you pay attention. Marcos ruled the Philippines from 1985 to 19, excuse me, 1965 to 1986. Most of that time as dictator. His rule was marked by brutality and corruption, extravagance. And after he was deposed in 1986, it was discovered that his wife Imelda, remember her? Had a closet full of 3,000 pairs of shoes. I don't know what kind of closet that is, but 3,000 pairs, which means she could wear a different pair of shoes every day, and it would take over eight years for her to wear the same pair twice. James here talks about four spiritual dangers, or a better word for it would be four spiritual sins. First, the sin of hoarding. He says, you have laid up treasure in the last days. The phrase laid up should be translated or could be translated as hoarded. You have hoarded treasure in the last days. Now, when we think of hoarding, we think of people who suffer from a pathological need to save up junk like this, okay? I've seen houses like that. That's not what James is talking about. He's not talking about saving your money. There's nothing wrong with saving. There's nothing wrong with planning. Hoarding is different. Hoarding is a selfish storing up from your, for yourself far more than you could ever need. Ecclesiastes chapter 5 says, I have seen a grievous un, uh, evil under the sun, wealth hoarded to the harm of its owners. Did you know that self-storage is now a $38 billion a year industry in the United States? We have now over 50,000 storage facilities in America. It, and it's growing every year, four billion in new construction every year, just of storage facilities. Why? Maybe we as a culture have more stuff than we can store in our houses. I think if James walked through our world and noticed 50,000 storage facilities for stuff that we, can't no long, we can no longer fit in our basements and our attics, he would wonder if we had a hoarding problem. He would wonder. Secondly, he talks about the sin of injustice. Verse 4, Behold, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, are crying out against you, and the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. Injustice. A couple of weeks ago, my wife and I noticed that our next-door neighbors, Wayne and Molly, had their whole house painted. Couldn't help but notice ladders and everything. These two guys were painting their house, working on it for a couple of weeks. And we'd been talking about at our house, hey, we need to have some stuff done, you know, we didn't know how to get started. So my wife talked to Molly, and they were really happy with the job done, so we, we called those guys, and we, we found out about them, we hired them, two brothers, uh, named uh, Javier and his brother Leo. They're Mexican immigrants to this country, run their own business, and for eight days they worked on our house, and they did a phenomenal job. They did way more than we had even thought they would do, uh, and never charged us a penny more, we got to know a little bit of their story every day as they were there. And what if we'd gotten to the end of that whole deal and we decided, you know, we don't really have a written contract here. They're immigrants. They probably don't have any lawyers. Let's just pay them half of what we agreed to. What are they going to do? Sue us? Now, all you're going, that'd be wrong. You can't do that. That'd be wrong. That's what he's talking about. That would be sin, right? That's wrong. And that, 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 that cry goes out to the Lord of hosts, James said. This was happening in that day. That's what he's talking about. The rich taking advantage of the poor just because they can. Third, he talks about the sin of self-indulgence. You have lived on the earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. Now, self-indulgence is pursuing pleasure and luxury to the point where it's harmful to your soul. Now, we all know that overindulgence physically is bad for us, literally fattening our hearts. But James is telling us that it's far more dangerous for our spiritual lives, the sin of self-indulgence. And finally, he talks about the sin of murder. Verse 6, you have condemned and murdered the righteous person. He does not resist you. Now, this is pretty obvious. Most of us recognize that as sin, right, murder? 
But James is saying, probably referring here to the violent persecution of believers that's going on right at the time. And it's also the end result of a whole series of other sins from hoarding to injustice to self-indulgence leads to the complete disregard of the value of another human being. It's sort of the end game of sinful living. So in all this, I think James, by looking at the negative, is suggesting to us a positive. He's suggesting that there is a different way. That's the third thing we want to look at today. So James warns, essentially, what not to do. So what does it mean for us as followers of Christ? Is, what's the better way that we should understand wealth, the better way to relate to money? I think James has in mind the teaching of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. He's referred to it often in his letter that we, are, that we call James. In the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 6, Jesus said, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and vermin destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moth and vermin do not destroy, where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So both James and Jesus are saying, essentially, be careful. Don't give your heart to your wealth. That's necessary. You need it to live but it's false security. It's a false God. It's an idol. So don't give it your deepest trust and devotion. No. Rather, give your heart to the God who can freely give what you cannot buy. Be careful with your heart. So how do you know where your heart is invested? Jesus said, it's where your treasure is. Your heart goes where your treasure is. So take a good look at where you put your treasure. Take a good look at where your wealth goes, how it's invested, how you treat it. If you take a good enough look, you'll see where your heart is. Jesus said so. Secondly, he says, don't hoard your wealth. I want to be careful here. Money's necessary. We all need it every day to live. There's nothing wrong with earning money, nothing wrong with saving money, nothing wrong with investing money, nothing wrong with financial planning. But when we hoard when we allow ourselves to believe that our wealth belongs to us entirely, that its sole purpose is for us, then we are hoarding. And so what's the cure for hoarding? Generosity. We believe here at Chapel Street that God is generous. God is the most generous being in the entire universe. Everything we have and experience is a gift from his generosity. We believe the gospel at its core is generous. For God so loved the world that he gave. And we believe that one of the telltale marks of a person's life who has been transformed by the grace of Christ is a growing generosity in all areas of life. So I think James would urge us to practice regular unhoarding. I don't, think even that, I don't think that's a word. I think I just invented it. But practice regular unhoarding. And finally, don't invest solely in your own kingdom, James would say. Invest also in God's eternal kingdom. You know, we all have our own little kingdoms. That's the way we live in North America. We have a little kingdom here, a little kingdom there, a little kingdom there. All of our own garage doors go right in. Kingdom. Don't invest in your own kingdom solely. Rather, invest also in God's eternal kingdom. We like to celebrate kingdom impact stories around Chapel Street. A lot of them happen through an initiative we call Serve the World, which is how we partner with local and global partners to make the gospel visible around the world through generosity. So this week I, I asked Pastor Bruce, uh, hey, give me a couple of examples of things happening right now uh, through the generosity of Serve the World that our people have given to that we, I could celebrate. Just give me three stories happening right now. He got back to me like within uh, half an hour. He says, here's a couple. First, Recently, we were able to, as a church family, give a gift of 1,000 Bibles to pastors in Uganda. I didn't even know about this one, by the way. 1,000 Bibles to pastors in Uganda. These are those guys holding up their, their life application study Bibles. Can you begin to calculate the return on that investment? How would you begin to calculate that? How many lives will be touched for eternity by that investment? Just 1,000 Bibles. A second one, we were able to give a gift of $15,000 to purchase a vehicle for Hope for Life, a ministry in Rwanda where Chapel Street, Chapel Street or Amanda Good is serving uh, these street boys in that part of the world. Uh, th this is actually the interior of that small vehicle. There are at least eight boys stuffed in there, all excited, you can see. Can we begin to calculate what that investment will produce in the lives of those boys so far away from us? 
Just one more. Coming up in October, many of you know about this, over 90 Chapel Streeters will be running the Chicago Marathon, each one raising money, at least $1,500 each, to provide clean water for villages in Africa through Team World Vision. Their goal, collectively, is $300,000 for water in Africa. How many of you are running in that event? Here are here right today. How many of you have actually contributed money to support these people who are running? Okay. You're making any... What's that? <laughs> right. You can, he'll, he'll be standing in the back. You can get his email information. The point is, no one gets to the end of their life and thinks, you know, I wish I'd built a bigger house. I wish I'd had 3,000 pairs of shoes. We get to the end of our lives and we wonder if we could have made a greater impact. How could I have been more generous than I was? I learned this past week of a family that we just recently redid their will, and they put Chapel Street, Serve the World, into their documents. My wife and I did the same thing a couple months ago, and by the way, we're getting ready to launch publicly in a few months, a few weeks, something we're called the Chapel Street Fund for Local and Global Impact. It functions kind of like an endowment. We'll guarantee that Chapel Street's impact around the world will far outlast all of us into the next generation. So look for that information coming out. Here's how Paul says it in 1 Timothy chapter 6. Command those who are rich in this present world, that would be us, every single one of us, not to be arrogant or to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age, so that, listen to this, they may take hold of the life that is truly life. So they will take hold of the life that's truly life. Will you bow with me as I close? Lord, thank you so much for your word. We thank you for the direct and sometimes cutting teaching of James. And we confess, and I confess, that we sometimes struggle with wealth. We're so tempted to see it as ours. We're tempted to hang on to it, to hoard it, to fear not having enough of it, sometimes even to love it and serve it. Teach us to live a different way, to honor you and worship you with our wealth. Grow in us a love for you and your kingdom that creates in us a generosity that produces an eternal impact. It's in your name that we pray.